I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland woodworker. Coming up. And when everything in my tray bounces, then it's down. <laughs> Building a chair from a tree, post and rung chair maker Tim Hintz invites us to his outdoor shop to explore this exciting process. Making through tenons can be a tough concept to grasp. Popular woodworking's Bob Lang has a technique you'll want to see. Then we're heading to Port Townsend, Washington, home to world-renowned cabinet maker and woodworker Jim Tolpin. Learn about the chance meeting that had this geophysics major charting a new course. Here was this guy just having an incredibly good time by himself, working with wood, building something that was going to go somewhere. I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And we'll take you underground to one of the most exciting woodworking societies on the net, Matt's Basement Workshop. All of this and more this time on the Highland Woodworker. I'm at Highland Woodworking. From tools to schools, this place is a source for everything in woodworking worldwide. Tim Hintz is known for his beautiful post and rung chairs. He invited us out to his Tennessee shop to show us his creative process. John Alexander's book, Make a Chair from a Tree, has inspired woodworkers all over the world. And we're here with Tim Hintz. Good to see you. Hey, Tim. He makes chairs from a tree. That's right. I start with a log and I end up with a beautiful chair. Well, Tim, this is, I guess, your outdoor workshop. Yeah, this is where it starts. I bring a log home on a trailer that I get the log from a log yard, and I generally work with oak. I'll keep splitting it with wedges and a fro till it's about the size I need. A shaving horse is a foot-operated clamp. So what I've got is a wedge here that I can adjust to the size of the piece. I'll put my piece of wood in there and I'll push down and it clamps it. Tim is very efficient at the sawhorse, shaping slats, rungs, and back legs. So I'll put the slat in there and pull on these ropes. And the friction of this rope pulling on that one holds it in there. So I've got a pretty good curve there. Here's a kind of a flat spot. I'll, I'm calling that pretty good. What do you think? Well, that's nice. So this is octagonal now. Mm -hmm. That's about as far as I'll go. It's, it's also fresh and wet. It's green. It is wet. And then the next step would be to take this, cut it to length, and then I'll turn it while it's still wet on my lathe. And then I'll get a bunch of parts and I'll put them in a, a heated dry box and that'll make sure that they shrink as much as they're going to. And then I'll turn the final dimension on the tenons. I take this piece we split out of the log and I'll clamp it again in my shaving horse. And first I'll start by making one face flat and I usually go along the rings of the tree. Just like in any other woodworking project, the stock has to be made four square. It's no different here. So now I've got a one inch width here and that's the width of my post here and the full width down here where the rungs go in. Then he tapers the top of the post. Well, Tim, it looks too thick to bend. It is, it's about an inch thick and it won't bend now, but if we give it enough steam and enough time, it'll bend like putty. Well, let's steam her up. All right, let's put it in my steam box here. All right. All right, it's in there. 45 minutes later, it's ready to bend in his form. He just drives a series of wedges in to hold the back leg in place as it drives. And one more. So we are down, we're flat on, against the form. Tim mortises the back legs to receive the slats. 
Next, he finishes the leg on his indoor shave horse. At his bench, he uses a hand plane to finish the job before laying out the rung mortises. So I've got a numberless marking gauge here, so I'm not confused. And I know that one rung goes here, one rung goes here, one rung goes there. I'll make sure that they don't look like dust or hair. I'll put a little cross on there. And now I'll take these to the drill press. And here we go. A little glue goes in the joints before pounding them home. And I can tell by sound when it's all the way in there. And I'll kind of compose this a little bit. I think this one will look best right here. And it's got the line. When that line disappears, I know it's all the way in there. And also by the sound. And number three. And I'm orienting these so that the rings go this way because wood moves more this way and the rays go this way, it moves less. So this hole is not going to shrink in height, but it's going to change in width because of the way that wood moves as it takes on moisture and gives it off with the change in seasons. From air conditioning to wood stove heat. And when everything in my tray bounces, then it's down. <laughs> So, I think we're all the way in there. I'm going to double check to make sure that the back of this and the front of it are parallel. So I'm going to make a check here. Good. Now I'll lay out for my mortises for my uh, cross rungs that go side to side, the front and back. That's 17 inches. 11 and a half and five and a half. Then it's off to the drill press for cross rung mortises. Now the front of the chair is wider than the back by about three inches. So I've got an inch and a half spacer here. And if I put the back of the chair up on that, that'll give me the perfect angle every time. Well, this is the moment. It comes together and it tells you whether it's been good or that other thing. This is it. So we've drilled all our mortises. They've got a little glue in them. I've got my front rungs and my back rungs. Remember we said they're a little longer in the front. So I'm going to start with this one, the frame piece, front top, and I'll drive that all the way into the top front hole. Both sides are assembled, then pounded together and squared up. Now that we've driven it all the way there, I'm lining this up with the door frame. And it looks like this edge is a little further back, so I'm going to tweak it. So now this lines up with the door frame and all my mortises, I'm looking down there to make sure that they're square to the front of the chair and, and everything's more or less square. Looks good to me. That's a beautiful job, Tim. So the next thing to do is to start putting the back slats in. In order to make the chair comfortable, we put the slats in now, we have put the first two in, and I want to line each slat up with the next one. So how I do that is I've got this pinch stick here and I've got it adjusted so that I'm sighting down this one and this one lines up with this one. So here's the length that that slat needs to be. And all that is is two rulers. It's two rulers and I've pinched it together with your common clothes pins. And then I'll put, I'll assemble it in there and then I'll drill holes and have hickory pegs to hold all the slats in. So it's a square peg in a round hole. 
that holds the slats in. And that'll finish up the construction of the seat of the frame. And then all you need to do then is weave a seat, right? Yep, I'll collect hickory bark in the springtime and I'll store that and until it's time to use it, then I'll soak it in water and it takes a couple hours to weave a nice 50 year seat in this chair. Well, this is gonna be a great chair. I enjoyed it. Thank well, you so much. Yeah, I'm glad to have you here and enjoyed having you in the Fresh Chairs Workshop. Fresh, that's the Tim Hintz way. Almost 20 years ago, I built my wife a heart pine Welsh cupboard. One of its features is the big crown molding around the top. The molding is several inches in height. How do you make it? If you don't have a shaper and a selection of expensive cutters, there is a way to make it out of your special project wood. Well, I just looked through some router bits I already had on hand and found that I could cut some edge profiles in some heart pine boards and stack them up. The great thing about edge forming bits is that you can use part of the profile or all of the profile and get different results. Remember with edge forming bits, you need negative thoughts. In other words, what is left after the bit takes away its shape is what you get. I am using a small cove a one inch cove, and an OG fillet, or fillet, although I prefer cod, of course, and stacking them together to see what they look like, that's the ticket. I use white side router bits, made in the USA. I use them because their consistent performance is absolutely the best. Still ahead, a breakthrough in making through tenons. Popular Woodworking's Bob Lang has a simple trick to make your next project really stick out. Then we'll spend a moment with a master, Jim Tolpin. Hear why he first had to train his mind before he can make a living with his hands. You're watching The Highland Woodwork. Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Put a Saw Stop in your shop. Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation. Craig, from the first cut to the final assembly providing woodworkers with products that help simplify woodworking challenges. Craig. Rikon Power Tools, a leader in woodworking power tools for over 10 years with a passion for quality and performance at an affordable price. Rikon has a full line of dependable tools, including a long list of industry-leading bandsaws like their new powerful 10-350 14-inch Professional. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Forest, manufacturer of the award-winning Woodworker 2, presents the PVW Blade, designed specifically for the rip and cross-cutting of plywood and plywood veneers without splintering or chip-outs. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for over 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand-cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, go to highlandwoodworking.com. Highland Woodworkers are found all over the world. Email a picture of you and your woodworking project along with your name and where you live to picture at thehighlandwoodworker.com.
With through mortises, mission furniture can be a challenge. Well, Bob Lang shows us how to lay them out and cut them with a router, this time on Popular Woodworking's Tips, Tricks, and Techniques. Bob, this is a beautiful mission-style table. I just love the through mortises and tenons. How do you do that? Well, it's actually harder to figure out than it is to do. Normally, when I build something like this, I make the mortises first and then cut the tenons to fit them. So in this case, uh, a friend of mine, Dale Barnard, had a jig, and I adapted how he did that uh, to make these, and it's actually pretty simple. This is the same table, and I've got all the other joinery put together. That's kind of the first step is to get the joinery worked out, sure. then get the shapes, then refine the surfaces. So what I figured out was if I can make my jig around where the tenons are, then I'm halfway home. So yeah, that's kind of reading reality there and, and working from Right, so if I've got this here and I can cut to it, then I can do it. So what I've got is this piece of plywood. I ripped so it's the exact width of my tenons there. So if I can get that exact length, which I should be able to do just by marking it there and there, I can cut this piece to fit, glue a couple pieces on either side, fill in the end, and I've got a jig that I can then use with a flush trimming bit in my router, and I can cut these mortises real easy. That's a great idea. Oh, well, I thought Let's so. Let's see it, yeah. yeah. These are the three pieces that were that one long piece, and that just fits right in. And then these two will go on the end. And if I can get you to hang on to the outside pieces, we can go ahead and put this together. And we'll just set that piece in, and one on each side and one on each end. And a lot of people don't realize you can glue plywood together like this. And that gets that in. And here's the other one. Those ease up a little bit. A couple more clamps and we're in business. Now usually I'll let this dry overnight if I can. If not, uh, in a couple hours the glue should be set up enough to use. Sure. Then I can just take this off, run my rod around the edges. Bob, how do you find out where the jig goes on the tabletop? Well, that's the next problem, and we got a solution for that. We'll work from the center out. So on the round blank here, I have two lines that go across the diameter at right angles to each other. So then I just found the center in between the two mortises and the jig, and I've set my compass to that point. So then I can come in and just find the center in here, make my marks on those other center lines, and now when I get the jig on, I've got a center of the mortise marked, and I just line those pencil lines up, and I'm good to go. But first, I've got to drill some holes in here over at the drill press so I can get the router in there. All right. Okay, so I've got the holes drilled. I clamp my jig to the tabletop, then flip that over and clamp that to the bench. So the router bit has got a bearing on the bottom, and that's the same diameter as the cutters. So this bit is going to follow the path of the square outline in the jig. So I want to have a good grip on it before I turn the router on. Okay. And I also want to turn the router off let it wind down so I don't nick anything on the way out. Sure. So 
One down, three more to go. I'll have a little bit of work with a chisel to square the corners up, but I'm almost there. Now I still have to square the corners up, but because I used a small diameter router bit, there isn't much there to, to chisel out. That's right. And this is actually easier than you think, because if I get the back of the chisel against the flat part of the mortise, I can just kind of swing it into the corner. And then that leaves me a nice sharp corner. And then I can just drop it down to make the cut. We're ready to give it a try. The moment of truth. Sometimes you may have to tweak it a little bit, but that's how it's supposed to work. And the tenons are through the top. Absolutely. All the way. way. It's supposed to be. Yeah. Still ahead, travel down Jim Talpin's thoughtful road to woodworking success. You're watching The Highland Woodwork. Masterpiece Wood Finish is a special three-part oil and wax system designed to enhance the beauty of wood. It's easy to apply, maintain, and repair. Applying several coats of the base coat, mid coat, and top coat to a prepared wood surface will create a finish that will make a craftsman smile. I helped develop Masterpiece Wood Finish, not just for your masterpiece, but mine too. Do you need wood? Then go nowhere but Bell Forest Products. Come stand in awe of our 20,000 square foot showroom that houses over 75 species of exotic wood, the largest in the Midwest. What more could you want? A knowledgeable staff? Well, come in and speak to one of these handsome young men because they know wood. They breathe wood. They eat wood. They live wood. They love wood. They are wood. So plan your adventure to Bell Forest Products, 200 East Hematite Street, downtown Ishpeming, or visit us online at bellforestproducts.com. Because we got wood. Bessie, a leader in clamps since 1936. If you know clamps, you know Bessie. Bessie, simply better. Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Put a Saw Stop in your shop. Introducing the ultimate flush trim rounder bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. If you can't make it to Atlanta, then you can always shop us on the web at www.highlandwoodworking.com. Moment with a Master is presented by Masterpiece Wood Finishes, helping you build beautiful furniture. For years, Jim Talpin was known for his high-end cabinetry. Now he has a new direction in his semi-retirement. We were invited to his exquisite hand tool workshop in Port Townsend, Washington, where he shared with us his talented hand tool skills and his eye for design. You can start to see this board is really starting to shine. Well, I, I knew it wouldn't have anything to do with fortune and probably less to do with fame. But it had a lot to do with getting some good woodworking jobs. Decades ago, woodworker Jim Tolpin took a chance that really paid off. A friend of his told him about a growing need for boat builders in the Pacific Northwest. Yes, there was work, and yes, it did pay double of what I could ever earn in New England for, for doing uh, boat work. And uh, so we moved out here, and I immediately got a job at a local uh, boat yard. The boat yard was located in Port Townsend, Washington, a charming artist community about 40 miles northwest of Seattle. They were assembling these really beautiful uh, cutters. Uh, I worked on that but ended up actually shifting back toward where my real expertise was at that point, which was custom cabinet work. I'd already done quite a bit of that in New England before, uh, and that was there was even more work and better pay in that realm. So. I uh, set up a cabinet shop in Port Townsend and 
built it. I was probably doing a, a kitchen, kitchen set a month at least, kitchen and a couple vanities uh, per month. Jim was doing what he loved. Really wanted to be doing stuff with my hands from my earliest memories and uh, uh, probably inspired somewhat by my grandfather who was a cabinet maker and he was retired when I knew him but I, I do have f very fond memories of working with him out in the atrium putting, helping him put together a cabinet going to the lumber yard with him and I know that wasn't what I was supposed to do but I always knew well I really liked working with my hands but you know in, in my cultural upbringing it was all about going to college and becoming a professional. Jim studied geophysics at the University of Massachusetts, but couldn't keep his mind from wandering back to his day working wood with his grandfather and a chance encounter he had with a boat builder named Bud. He was uh, you know, a product of the early 1900s, and uh, by the time I knew him, he was uh, not really retired, but he was in his 60s, still building boats, mostly by himself, down on the Piscataqua River. I remember walking in and there was this huge hull. He was building a 47 foot long schooner by himself, all wood of course, and uh, working away and I heard the singing coming from inside the hull. And, uh, and I realized what he was doing, he was singing the Iliad in Greek to himself for self-entertainment. He looked over and saw me and the uh, first thing he said to me, Hey, how are you? You like boats? And uh, I said, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, yeah, I do like boats. What I didn't quite tell him at the time was what I really liked was the fact that uh, here was this guy just having an incredibly good time by himself, working with wood, building something that was going to go somewhere. I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And that this was an obviously highly educated person who was working with his hands. That was the trigger for me. I said, oh, it is okay to be highly educated and to just work with your hands. I, and it sort of gave myself permission to go down this road. But there was another road that was opening up for Jim that would take him from local professional cabinet maker to one of the biggest names in woodworking. The writing was an outgrowth of the ca custom cabinet business because what I was doing there was I was trying to find the most efficient process I could in order to compete. And I did figure it out and I realized what I had done is I just wrote a book on how to, how to build custom cabinets in, in a small shop, in a garage. And I said, you know, other people would really be interested in reading this. And uh, I got a book about how to make a book proposal to a publisher and I, I uh, sent it out to uh, about 30 publishers and Taunton Press called back almost immediately and uh, said, uh, this is a book that we've kind of been looking for. Basically, I was in the right place at the right time with the right product. Building traditional kitchen cabinets was a hit. Many more books followed. His latest, By Hand and I, was co-written by fellow woodworker George Walker. It's an interesting read about building by proportions. I used this really ancient system, pre-industrial system of design to come up with just what the proportions are, why it's the shape it's in, why these are the size they are. And again, none of this was about dimensions. We're not talking about two and five sixteenths of an inch. We are talking about what's the ratio of this width to the overall width. That's what it's about. It's a ratio and it's a so whole So if you knew one piece, one measurement. That's all you need. And you're, you're in. All you need is one measurement. All I needed to know was the height of this. So I have this one height. In this case, I believe it's about 27 inches, something like that. So that's my only measured parameter. Everything else after that is a ratio. And on this particular piece, it's a two to three ratio. In other words, what we have here is a square here, and I can go to the board if we need to, plus a third of a square. This is a square, and a, this is what would have been called a square and a third piece of furniture. So it's a square with another third built on top of it to create the rectangle. So I have a two to three ratio. Um, ratios, what about these? How do I know how wide to make these legs? I took this span and I took a twelfth of it. It's one twelfth. 
And how do I know how to make this apron? And, this, and of course, on the apron on the front contains a drawer. So what's, what is this? It turns out, and this is hearkening back to the work that was done by thousands of people for thousands of years creating the ratios that were in the columns, the, the famous Grecian columns. Well, it turns out that the architrave on a column is, some of them, one-sixth the height of the span. So that's what I used here. Just to see if it would look right. Looks right to me. Just as simple as that. So this is one-sixth of the height. That's so fascinating. Yeah. And you've got all that in that book. It's all about that. And you know, it isn't about the prescription. It's not like saying, well, you did this, so now you have to have one-sixth the height for it to look right. It doesn't mean that. It means you can try that. It's a very simple, right off your dividers, you just space that out. If you don't like one-sixth, try one-seventh. Try a fifth. Or go in between, but you know, it may not look right in between because you, you've just left whole number ratios behind. In music, when you leave whole number ratios, you start getting dissonance. So this is, um, you know, two to three is one of the ratios in music, too, that performs, I think it's a perfect six. So this is a way to keep from having visual dissonance in your yes. piece. Yes, and George and I are starting to think really that, uh, you know, it might be that we have as much visual sense of harmony as we do an auditory sense of harmony. And it's, again, so what we're doing in this book is we're sort of teaching this language, this ancient language of the artisans, just the way you might be teaching the ancient language of musicians. And it, it, they're very similar in many ways. Um, it's like we can hear when something is dissonant. It turns out we're pretty convinced now that you can see when something is dissonant. And it's almost always because you strayed from whole number ratios. I mean, nature doesn't stroll away from whole number ratios because then molecules don't hold together. You don't have H2.5 to one, you have H, you know, you have H2O, uh, unless you're in a nuclear explosion, and then, you know, for a couple seconds there, you have some real dissonance happening. Well, so I wanted to avoid a nuclear explosion in my living room, so I stuck with, I stuck with whole number ratios. And so, you know, on, on these, you know, here's the little blades, top and bottom, how do I proportion those? Well, this is one-sixth of the height, I just took this as one-sixth of this. And again, that sort of information, the DNA that's coded into those columns, kind of give you this sort of information. You know, you're stepping down from large scale to, to smaller scale, from macro to micro, but the smallest part of a column is in a whole number ratio to the overall width of the shaft and everything else. They're all related. Is that why this looks a third and a third and yes. a third? Yeah. See? Okay. You, see, now you have visual ability to read What's going on here? Just about a mile down from Jim's custom hand tool workshop is where he gets to put his passion as a woodworker, intellectual thinker, and author into practice. He's an instructor at the Port Townsend School of Woodworking, a place of constant learning that this skilled woodworker helped to establish. I'll, I'll say it right out right. I, I am not a master craftsman. Uh, you know, there's people that way beyond anything that I could possibly do out there. Uh, but what I am starting to get masterful at, I think, is, is teaching this stuff. I think that's really where I think I'm starting to achieve some mastery. People are going away pretty happy, and you know, that makes me happy. Matt Vanderlist takes an online approach to teach and create a bond with woodworkers. This time on our Woodworkers Community Spotlight, we're shining the light on Matt's Basement Workshop. Matt's Basement Workshop is the first and longest running podcast dedicated to the hobbyist woodworker on the internet. Started in January of 2006 as an audio-only show intended for listening on MP3 players, it eventually expanded into the world of videos as we progressed from simply talking about woodworking and giving advice to listeners to actually showing techniques and eventually even building projects in front of the camera. Matt's Basement Workshop is not a traditional online community in the sense that it doesn't have a forum or a chat room, but it's been an online destination for woodworkers over the last seven years. And visitors are strongly encouraged to leave comments, questions, and suggestions about the numerous articles and videos posted on the website, and frequently, these have even turned into ongoing discussions on social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. 
The show has always been an opportunity for myself to share my woodworking experience with other woodworkers, but more important, it's been an amazing resource from which we've been able to interact with each other and in return, share that knowledge. And another example of the sense of community that Matt's Basement Workshop offers is that it's routinely shared by visitors with family and friends who are looking for specific woodworking information and sometimes even inspiration. It's not unusual to receive emails that start with something as simple as, I found your website from a friend who suggested I visit, or even occasionally, my wife saw that a project that you just built and wants me to do the same. Now, how do I get started with it? With over seven years worth of content, everything from projects to techniques, tool reviews, audience question and answer, and so much more, there's a very good chance that you're going to find something in the website's archives that you'll enjoy. And since it's available 24-7, year-round, the easiest way to stay current with the content is to subscribe to one of the four RSS feeds that we offer. Be it a subscription to the entire website, which includes every post, video, and even the occasional downloadable file, to our regular standard definition videos, perfect for mobile devices, and even our 720p HD video feed, which is perfect for watching on bigger screens like TVs via a set-top device. It's easy to find content that fills your needs. Maybe it's even the feed that started it all, the audio-only version, which gives you the same content as the videos, but they're stripped down so you can listen on the go to give you that woodworking fix that only woodworkers would ever understand. And the best part about it, whichever one you choose, they're all completely free, and it's a great opportunity to enjoy woodworking even when you can't be in the shop. If you'd like your woodworking society, community, or organization to be highlighted on the Highland Woodworker, then contact us at this email address and we'll tell you how. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that does it for this episode of the Highland Woodworker. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker.